Hey, everybody, this is Irma with Mixnology, a mixture and form series in L.A., New York City, and Chicago this summer. Today, we have a very special guest for you comic book fans, uh, Jerry Conway. Uh, Jerry is the co-creator of The Punisher, Firestorm, and wrote for both Marvel and DC, including Amazing Spider-Man and Justice League of America. Today, we also have a very special co-host, Brianna Earl of There If By Space. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing good, great. Doing good. <laughs> Fantastic. Jerry, uh, all the way from, I want to say, L.A. Yes. Uh, well, the, the Los Angeles area. I'm actually uh, up in Ventura County, which is uh, a little bit north of, of L.A. Okay. Yeah, it's, I know it's, it's hot enough. everywhere. So hot it's there, very hot, hot. <laughs> it, yeah. uh, I want to say 100 here in, in Virginia, so I can imagine it must be 110 where you are. Well, no, actually, uh, maybe maybe in Arizona it's, uh, it's hotter. It's actually in the high 80s for us here. But uh, if you go further south into L- into LA, it does go up about 10 degrees, so high 90s. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So. It's it's brutal. It's always brutal. Yeah, very brutal. Uh, well, it's just it's a pleasure having you on. Uh, I don't know how many people rode for Marvel and DC, uh, so it's it's really cool to I guess get both perspectives and. Brianna over here is a lifelong fan, she says. Yes, I'm a huge comic book fan. I've been reading since I was um, four or five was when I got my first comic. So. Oh, good for Pretty you. Pretty exciting. Thank you. Yeah. So, so we completely warped your mind by this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a good thing, though. So, so Jerry, we're going to start off with the most tedious question of all time, and I'm, I'm sure you get this a lot, but... Uh, for for anyone listening who actually wants to be comic book art, uh, comic book writer themselves, uh, I would love to know how you got started in comic book work, and what sparked your interest in this medium in the first place. Well, like uh, like uh, Bri, I was uh, I was a uh, a lifelong comic book reader. I mean, I started reading. I don't think I was as young as she was, but I did start reading comics at a very early age, uh, and fell in love with Marvel uh, around the time of. Fantastic Four number four, number three, number four, something like that, because they were both on the stands at the same time. Uh, this is back when newsstands news would keep the same, keep comics up and, as, as long as there were still copies to be sold. So I fell in love with them. I fell in love with the Marvel characters. I was a fan. I wrote and drew my own comics. Uh, I happened to live in New York. <clears throat> and one summer, I found out that Marvel, uh, or rather DC, had a uh, a tour uh, in the summer. Uh, every Thursday at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, they would take you on a little tour of their office. And I convinced my dad to take me one one Thursday, uh, and really enjoyed it. Enjoyed the idea of being behind the scenes, but found that that the Editors were actually fairly uh, open to the kids talking to them. So I just went back the next week, and then I went back the next week, and then I went back the next week. <laughs> and I spent, like, the entire summer uh, going there uh, and actually at one point asked uh, if I could uh, work as an intern uh, at the office uh, and spent a couple of weeks, you know, working around the production office uh, uh and I was, I think I was 14 years old when this was happening. Okay. And I, I remember reading in a uh, news, newsletter, uh, uh, a letters page on the, on one of the uh, Legion of Superheroes comics about a guy named Jim Shooter who was also writing comics, who was writing comics who was 13 years old. And I thought, well, you know, if he can do it, I can do it. Uh, so I started pitching <laughs> ideas. And I spent my, I guess it was my, sophomore year in high school uh every couple of weeks taking the train in from queens into manhattan and knocking on the door at dc and submitting ideas and talking to the different editors did this for about a year and the next summer uh continued it and managed to i don't i don't even really know how or why i mean i think the editor uh, who bought my first story a guy named murray boltonoff uh, assumed that I was working for Dick Giordano because I was always coming in and sitting at Dick, sitting with Dick at his desk, you know, and talking to him. And he just assumed that I was, you know, this hot young talent, you know, that Dick had discovered and he wanted part of it. So he gave me a script 
to write, and uh, the rest, as they say, is uh, history. Oh, love it, love it, love it. What was uh, I got to ask you? What was the most recent comic you've read? Not as a writer, but as a, a reader. What was the most recent you read? Oh well, um, I read a lot. I mean, I do read them, you know, fairly frequently. So the so the most recent comic. Uh, how, how about the most the one I found the most memorable recently? was Rebirth, you know, the first uh, issue of Rebirth uh, that Jeff Johns wrote. Uh, okay. Really enjoyed, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm also a big fan of, of uh, uh, Kelly Stu DeConnick's uh, work at Image, uh, both Bitch Planet and uh, Pretty Deadly. Uh, I like uh, pretty much everything that, that uh, uh, Bendis does, uh, you know, it's 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 a variety of things. I mean, I like Scott Schneider's work on Batman. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I like uh, Dan Schlott's work on Spider-Man. You know, it's I'm I'm voracious. <laughs> hey, uh, I mean, it looks like you. I, I, I'm glad that you you're not only a, a writer, but you're a fan of the medium yourself. Uh, you know, itself. So it's always great to hear somebody reading other material. From other other writers and other artists, so that's that's fantastic. Kudos to you. Um, this is actually something that may be a little controversial to ask you, if you don't mind me asking. But as a veteran in the comic book world, are you happy overall with how film adaptations are with comics? Uh, yeah, well, overall, yes. Uh, I have I have specific beefs with particular uh, uh, films, but you know, generally speaking, I think. You know, you could you, you you can't but be impressed by the quality of the adaptations that we've seen since uh, since the mid 2000s. Uh, you know, there's been a, a tremendous. Uh, uh, gr- I mean, uh, it, it, it's it's hard. It, it, it's really hard to pick a bad movie. I mean, there have been some really bad movies, but for the <laughs> most part, you know, for the most part, you know, you got to say this is just a, 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 a an amazing output, you know, of, of great films. Right. And intelligent too. I gotta say, intelligent as well. Oh yeah, uh, definitely. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of uh, the Marvel uh, Netflix material and uh, the DC uh, CW mm-hmm. material. Right. Love it. Love it. Love it. Okay, Jerry, so what was the most difficult comic that you had to pitch, whether it was to Marvel or to DC? Difficult to pitch. Um, well, usually the, the one that, that, the one that re- re- results in my first assignment. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, I've, I, I, I've been in and, in and out of the field and been in and out of yeah. both companies uh, and some other subsidiary, smaller companies. Uh, over the years, and you know, you you end up having inevitably having to convince people over and over again that you can do the work. So <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's uh, and so it's always the first time. You know, it's even for people like myself who have had a long established career, uh, you have to convince an editor to give you a shot that first time. And usually, it's you know, with some trepidation on their part. Uh, you know, until they actually had the opportunity to see what you can do. So that that first story is always the, the most difficult. Uh, but in terms of controversial pitches, uh, I don't. There haven't been many where I uh, where I've pitched an idea that an editor said, you know, I'm just not going to. No, we'll just never do that. You know, usually they they come back with, well, could we adjust it like this? Could we try that? You know, something that. Uh, uh, makes it more commercial or maybe makes it makes it a better story in some way. Can you give any tips for people who are planning on pitching to an editor anytime soon? Any tips? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah the, 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 the main tip is uh, be prepared to be rejected. Uh, mm-hmm. Be prepared to be rejected over and over and over again. Uh, being a writer or being an artist is a self selecting career career. You are the one who decides that you're going to be a writer or an artist, uh, and whether someone else accepts your work or doesn't accept your work is really irrelevant. <laughs> you know, if, <laughs> if you're the you're the only person who can stop you, you know, by giving up. 
so, you know, I spent I spent a year, a uh, year and a half uh, trying to break into writing comics, which is not a long time by any stretch. But I had no real sense of, of what was an appropriate amount of time. Uh, and at one point or, or another, you know, I felt like I had to give up. Uh, and I, a friend of mine uh, who wasn't a writer, you know, said, well, why would you, why would you give up? What, what would you be doing instead? <laughs> I was like, well, I didn't have a good answer. <laughs> so, you know, the truth is there's no real, the only real advice that you can give someone who, who's trying to break in to anything is make sure it's something you really want to do and then don't let anybody stop you. you know? uh, just be prepared yeah, yeah. for rejection, you know. Yeah. But it's not relevant because you can look at all the people who, who've been big successes in any area and they will tell you their horror stories are being rejected uh, <laughs> repeatedly. There you go. Life lessons by Jerry Conway. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, if you could, if you could take a look at your entire career, um, you know, whether it be Justice League of America, Daredevil, I believe uh, even Miss Marvel, and everything in between, is there a certain specific panel in all the comics that you were the most attached to, or you felt the most uh, personal connection to when writing? Uh, a particular panel. Uh, or, yeah, or, 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 I, I, or I tend to, yeah, I tend to think in terms of story sequences. Uh, so I, I guess, I guess I, I have several favorites. I mean, mm. and, and there, there's nothing which I, which I would say this one is more than another. But some, pick out some, fa- uh, pick out some favorites. I mean, I, I obviously enjoyed uh, and thought I did a good job on my first run on Spider-Man uh, mm. back in the uh, early '70s. Uh, I really had a great time writing Batman and detective comics for uh, a couple of years in the mid eighties, early eighties, uh, really enjoyed, uh, and then I thought I did a pretty good job when I came back to Spider-Man and wrote spider uh, spectacular Spider-Man and web Spider-Man. Uh, and right now I'm really, really enjoying the work I'm doing on Carnage. So, okay. you know, it's, it's every, uh, there, there, there have been a handful of product uh, projects that I've worked on where we're simply doing the work because I've been asked to do the work. But, uh, for the most part, I just, I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. So there you go. Very, very cool. You mentioned Spider-Man. I have to ask you this question because uh, I think a lot of, we, a lot of us are Spider-Man fans. Uh, I read a quote in an interview in 2011, and I have to ask you about it now. Uh, you said uh, something along the lines of um, uh, Spider-Man should never grow up. Um, years later, we've had different movies, different, uh, I guess you kind of say different uh, ages represented by the actors. Does that comic still hold up today? Well, what, what's great about Spider-Man right now, uh, and, and the way that it's being interpreted at Marvel and, and also in the films is that we're seeing different versions of Spider-Man, you know, different versions of Peter Parker. Well, I mean, the, the version that I was most attached to uh, as a reader was the one that I read when I first started reading the book, which was the, the young teenage Peter Parker uh, who, uh, you know, was dealing with the, the problems of adolescence. And I always, I always thought that that was something unique to Spider-Man. When, once you get him up into his 20s and 30s, he's basically like a lot of other characters. You know, uh, he's, he's a young adult or, you know, a, a, a young, uh, uh, or an adult, just an adult. So right. there's, there's not as much uh, uniqueness to that, to that interpretation for me. Uh, right. But that, that being said, you know, there's obviously a, a, a great fondness for that version of the character, too. I think it's great that the, the, the new movie is going to be uh, really embracing Peter as a teenager. I think that's a terrific, uh, a terrific way to go, because, you know, we've seen mostly even though in the other films he was supposedly a teenager, he was being played by guys in their mid 20s. Uh, right, mid to right, late right. Tw- mid, <laughs> yeah, mid to late twenties. So he never felt like a kid, you know. Uh, he felt like a he felt like some a kid on a, a CW show. 
uh, right. which is to say a guy <laughs> in his late 20s. <laughs> so so I, I'm looking forward to see the Tom Holland version, uh, you know, an extended version of that. I, I loved it in uh, Civil War. Uh, yes. So it's it's going to be really fun to see. Kind of going off of that a little bit, um, how did you feel about Gwen Stacy's death in the new movie? Did you feel that it did justice to the story that you had created, or how did you feel about it? Well, I, th- I, I think it was, you know, that, that movie was kind of, I think, overstuffed um, mm-hmm. with too, too many things. And it also, it, 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 it didn't provide Peter with a catharsis for the tragedy. Uh, somebody was recently pointing out uh, in, in some uh, online discussion that, that one of the things that, that made that original story palatable for some readers, you know, I mean, it wasn't palatable for all readers, obviously, but <laughs> what made it palatable was the presence of Mary Jane in Peter's life, uh, providing him with, you know, the possibility that life will go on, you know, that, mm-hmm. that, that while he's in the midst of tragedy, there's an opportunity, you know, for, for a future. Uh, you don't really have that in the movie. Uh, you know, there, his recovery from that tragedy is so arbitrary because, you know, it's just sort of like time heals all wounds, you know, six months later, he's fine. You know, and I, 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 yeah. I, I think that, I think that kind of doesn't really give you an opportunity to mourn, you know, and to, and to deal with the tragedy. I would have actually, if I was structuring that movie, I probably would have had her death occur uh, about at the end of Act One, and mm-hmm. Ooh, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, then deal with the the, the repercussions in his life, his feelings of of, of uh, what that means to him, and have him come back, you know, for Act Three. I mean, you know, d- d- really play on the, the the emotional consequences of the storyline, uh, but they didn't do that. You know, I mean, they had. I think I think there was too much producer interference in that film uh Mm -hmm. from what i understand that you know the the director and the writers were under a great deal of pressure to put as many toy uh, toy uh based uh as much toy based material into the story as they could possibly get so that uh they could sell some more toys um and i think that did a disservice to the uh to the to the tragedy of that story Hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, what makes a superhero memorable? I know it's a very broad question, but you you've written many. Uh, what makes the ones memorable? Well, I think I think superheroes are uh, they're archetypes for for very human uh, uh, situations and conditions. So a what makes a, a hero memorable is does he function as an archetype? Uh, does he function to speak to a larger human uh, situation? That's that's why I, I say Peter Parker was best for me as a teenager because he addressed the angst of teenage life. You know, he addressed the the feeling of, of uh, you know. The, the the dismay of not being an adult, but feeling very, very responsible, you know, for your choices as a, as a teenager. Uh, but, you know, being caught in this adult world with kind of adult powers, but at the same time, not being taken seriously as an adult, you know, so it's, it, it really worked from an archetypical point of view in the same way Batman works great, you know, as, as the, uh, the person who's who's got the damaged psyche because of the childhood trauma and right. is working that through, you know, uh, and, you know, other characters, that, I mean, the, the superhero characters that that uh, capture our imagination and, and, and stick with us are the ones that, that speak to those fundamental, you know, truths. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's why some characters seem like they ought to be great characters, but yeah. then they don't quite make it. You don't know why. Because they don't have a fundamental purpose, you know, that, that they speak to. Absolutely. Very, very cool. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so have you watched the, the new Daredevil series? And what do you think about it? 
I love it. I mean, the, you're talking about the, the TV series or the, the, yes. the comic? Yes, the, yes, the, the, the TV. The TV series, I think, is terrific. I mean, it, it takes uh, an interpretation of Matt Murdock that was, uh, I mean, it wasn't the original, completely the original interpretation, although it was always implied, I think, in the original uh, uh, version of the character. Uh, you know, the, the, this kind of tor- tortured, uh, I mean, the, the great thing about uh, the Marvel characters is that a lot of them actually have uh, or used to have symbolic uh, uh, traits, you know, that, that, that sort of identified the particular wound that they carried that was being acted out in the, the powers. Uh, you know, like Iron Man had a broken heart. Uh, Captain America had been frozen in time, uh, you know. I mean, and Daredevil, and Daredevil represented blind justice. Uh, there's, a, there's a real interesting, you know. And I don't think Stan ever thought any of this through. He's more of an instinctive, primitive writer than than anything else. And the collaborators that he worked with were terrific storytellers and artists who didn't, I think, also think this stuff through. But when you when you hit uh, when you hit on something that works, that's what sticks. And uh, mm-hmm. I think that's what's great about uh, uh, the Daredevil series, you know, is that it's, it's, caught, a, uh, it's caught, an, caught an archetype and it's really embraced it. There you go. Uh, Jerry, we're going to ask a few more questions before we hop into the audience questions. I would love to sure. know from a, a writer perspective myself, um, and speaking also of you know, we just mentioned Netflix shows and, and movies. You've written screenplays in the past, correct? Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, with that being said, do you have more screenplays under your belt, do you think? Oh, uh, no, I, le- I left the, uh, the, the film business about 10 years ago because it was driving okay. me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'd love I to imagine. write an episode. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to write a single episode of, of one of the various television shows based on my characters. But, okay. uh, you know, other than that, you know, I have no, no real desire to, to work in that business anymore. <laughs> Honesty is good, yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just a very high-stress business, you know, and you have to, you have to commit a, a great deal of your, your uh, life energies to it to be successful in it. And uh, I was willing to do that in my 30s and 40s and not so much, you know, as I've gotten older. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jerry. So, if you could give somebody just off of the streets a comic book, and that it could change their preconceived notions about what comic books are like, which comic would you give them, and why? Oh wow! Uh, let's see, somebody off the street. I I, think I might actually give them Matt Fracton's uh, Hawkeye uh, yes. series uh, because it's it's hilarious you know first of all it's a funny <laughs> yeah. funny funny comic book uh it's extremely well written and it also uh deconstructs your 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 notions of what a, a typical comic book uh would be so for somebody who's never read a comic and we're talking probably as an adult uh here you know uh mm-hmm. yeah. kids you know, for a kid i would or i'd give them a batman comic or, or a superman comic or spider-man you know something but but if you're an adult and you want to know that there's a lot more going on, I think, I think Matt's work or, or Kelly Sue's work uh, or, uh, you know, any, any image comic, for example, uh, could, could kind of knock them out. I mean, the, the DC and Marvel books are terrific, but uh, for the, they're kind of hard for, for a casual reader to get into uh, yeah. because, because they are so – comic book you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly and you have to and, and there's nothing and that's not meant in a negative way but but you but but you sort of have to know it's like it's like listening to jazz music if you're if you're almost if you're not already a jazz music fan it's really hard to get to become a jazz music fan because <laughs> there's not a lot of ways into it uh it's a strange it's a strange thing there you Definitely. go yeah <laughs> Um, Jerry, uh, we have some questions from uh, Twitter for those who couldn't make it today. So I'm going to ask those before we hop into the live uh, audience. Uh, Vicky from Burbank wants to know, 
whether it's your movie, or I'm sorry, whether it's your characters or someone else's, who should get a film ad- adaptation in your opinion? Uh, it, whether what, what was the first part of it? I, I didn't get. Oh well, yeah, whether it's a character you wrote or is another character or another writer's character, uh, who should get a film adaptation? Oh well, I mean, I'm going to obviously talk about my characters. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would actually, I would love to see an adaptation of uh, Cinder and Ash, the uh, uh, comic uh, miniseries that I wrote back in the '80s that was reprinted recently uh, by DC. Uh, you know, that's that's kind of a straight uh, suspense slash mystery. Uh, story, so I would love that. I'd also love to see Firestorm on the big screen. I think yes, I think like, uh, he, he is terrific on Legends of Tomorrow, uh, but I think it's it, it's a potential. Uh, some of the characters aren't. Gotcha. Very very cool. Uh, we also have Derek from Wisconsin wants to know. Oh, here's a good one. What is the most overused superpower? <laughs> uh, probably <laughs> flying. <laughs> okay. Flying and or flying and or super strength. You know, uh, they're kind of you know they, you, you tend to see them a lot. Uh, I think those are those, those are the most. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Now uh, I'm going to do something really risky. Um, I'm because I don't see people's names on my screen. I'm gonna unmute everybody. So if you have a question, uh, try not to over talk each other. Oh, but go ahead and everybody's ask. gonna everybody's <laughs> gonna talk at once. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe I'm gonna unmute. Uh, if you have a question, please go ahead and shoot. Oh, anybody? Too shy. Too shy. We have some, we have some shy callers, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody going once? Twice. Oh, hey, I was, wondering, I was wondering if oh. you might have an anecdote as to uh, some of the heartache you went through on one of your screenplays or teleplays when you were in Hollywood. Uh, sure. I actually have a, a, a story that uh, I tell whenever I whenever I want to emphasize the, the rampant stupidity of the Hollywood movie, movie system. I came up with an idea. This is one of the only times that I actually sold a script based on a pitch. Um, you know, I was mostly hired to write screenplays. Roy Thomas and I were working together as, as a, a writing team. Uh, but we'd always go in and we'd pitch projects, pitch ideas, and then we'd be hired to write something. Um, but this was one where I sold sold the idea. It was actually something that I'd come up with in the shower the day that we were going into pitch, and it was the last idea out of like four ideas. And I didn't even really have it fleshed out. But this was the pitch. I said, I'd like to do a movie that's a riff on The Seven Samurai. Like, and for American audiences, The Seven Samurai is The Magnificent Seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea, though, is that we're in a far distant future in which the entire world, is, the entire planet has is, is been pacified. People are, have, there hasn't been a war in like a thousand years and an alien invasion of the Earth, and they don't know how to fight back. So they go back through time. They have a time machine. They go back through time, and they pick warriors from different eras. They've got a samurai. They've got a guy from Vietnam. Uh, they've got uh, a warrior a woman from ancient Greece. They've got just a variety of these different people, of course, seven of them. And these people have to come together to fight this alien invasion force and to teach people how to fight back. And that was the idea. It was a simple pitch. It's very simple. It's very clear. They bought it on the spot. And Roy and I were like, holy crap, this is amazing. You know, we, we just sold an idea based on a pitch. So we were ecstatic. We got the most money that we'd ever gotten for a deal based on this idea. And us uh, oh. to write it when we got a call from the, uh, our agent who told us that he had had a conversation with the head of the studio. And the head of the studio said, I love this idea. I, I think it's a terrific notion. 
can you drop the time travel angle? <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, if we drop the time travel angle, it's seven samurai. <laughs> it's nothing else <laughs> except the time travel angle. Oh, yeah, but I don't want to, you know, I, I, I think when audiences, this is exa- a direct quote, you know, I think when audiences go see a science fiction movie, they want to see a science fiction movie in every, pa- every frame. They, they don't, you know, I don't want anything set in the Wild West. I don't want anything set, that, people don't like time travel movies. And I what? countered with, wait, I, I, I countered with, this was 1983. And I said, wait a minute. There are three films currently in production that I know about. This was back, back at that time. I said, uh, one of them is Steven Spielberg's next big movie his, from his production company. It's called Back to the Future. That's the time for <laughs> uh, Star Trek is planning one called The Voyage Home. That's a time travel movie. And there's this little film called Terminator that's on the way. And he says, yeah, but those guys are all going to lose money. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's still somewhere a wall in, in Los Angeles uh, near where I used to live that has an indentation from my head hitting it oh, repeatedly so we ended up having to write this movie because we, we had been contracted we sold the right you know we wrote this movie without any time travel angle uh, and it was basically a, a, a movie set in the future about a pacifist society in which there were only seven people who knew how to fight uh, <laughs> fighting an alien invasion. And of course, nothing happened with it because what the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's my, that's what, that literally was, I said, that's it. I'm out of this, you know, and I stopped writing films at that point and went to write TV. So, <laughs> so there's Hollywood for you. Good thing you got yep. out. <laughs> Good thing you got out. And you drop the uh, time travel angle. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, crazy. Uh, does anyone else have a question who's not shy to ask? Five, four, three. <laughs> uh, Derry, <laughs> thank you so much for your time today. Do you have any uh, pages you'd like to share via Twitter or maybe an official site you'd like to share with, uh, with listeners? Uh, yes, I'm on Twitter as Jerry Conway, G-E-R-R-Y-C-O-N-W-A-Y. I'm usually... T- uh, tweeting a few times a day, uh, mostly angry political tweets, but uh, with the occasional comic book and movie observation as well. <laughs> there you go. And uh, Bree, uh, how about you? Would you like to share your pages? Uh, sure. It's Bloody Horror Bree, like horror movies, um, and then also Free If by Space on Twitter. Those were where you can find me. Awesome. Right. And you can follow Mixnology, M I X K N O W. L-E-D-G-Y. Thank you guys so much for your time today, and we'll see you next week.